white people have benefited from hundreds of years of racism and racist systems in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, that have systematically empowered whites and disempowered minorities. Um, from the 1830 Indian Removal mm -hmm. Act that uh, forcibly relocated Native Americans mm -hmm. to the benefit of whites, to the 1862 Homestead Act that gave away millions of mm -hmm. acres of land for free yeah. to the benefit of whites, to Jim Crow laws mm -hmm. that benefited whites, mm -hmm. to redlining. I mean, we're here in Chicago, yep. and this was the this was the was. kind of this is yeah. this is where it all happened. Where it still today. redlining, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the effects are still going on today, and yeah. discriminatory housing practices where um, minorities were ex excluded from home. entire. Uh, black neighborhoods yeah. where just draw a red line around that neighborhood and in the laws it's written I know they like they cannot get a federally backed home loan right. to improve their home buy a new home whatever right. and then not only were they locked into their own neighborhoods to the benefit of whites but the white neighborhoods the suburban white neighborhoods then drew up covenants mm -hmm. that said you can't sell your home to a black person right to the benefit of whites. So you mm -hmm. see the greatest kind of key to wealth um, mm -hmm. and privilege and access is home ownership. Mm -hmm. and, and there's whole communities of people, people of color locked out yeah. of the, the escalator to, uh, to accrued wealth, yeah. locked out to the benefit of whites immigration laws mm -hmm. that benefited whites. Social security initially came out again Benefited whites because it said, mm -hmm. oh, well, um, domestic workers are not covered in that. Well, guess what? Literally 85% of African Americans could not have access to Social Security when it first came out. Right. Again, to the benefit of whites, post-World War II subsidies. I'm going somewhere with this history lesson. <laughs> post-World War II subsidies for returning soldiers that benefited whites. Yeah. If you were a black man. You came back from World War II fighting in <laughs> for your country. You could not get access to a home loan, mm -hmm. um, and to subsidies. Um, white people have benefited from generations of accrued wealth, mm -hmm. uh, accrued access, accrued privilege that we as white people neither acknowledge mm -hmm. nor denounce or decry or anything. Um, in fact, just recently, the Pew Research Center came out with a study um, that showed, this is data, this isn't sentiment, this isn't like yeah. my opinion, this is data yeah. that white households are worth roughly 20 times wow. as much as black households. Yeah. Again, that's not sentiment. That's not like, I feel like there's a problem. Mm. That's data. Yeah. And yet I have a hard time mm. convincing my, some of my white friends huh. that white privilege is both an ongoing issue and an ongoing problem. Yeah. And exist and even exist. Sure. I don't know if I have a question for you, but how do you like? Okay, how would you define white privileges? What? How have you seen in your experience or your kind of knowledge base? How have you seen that mm -hmm. come about? Um, what are some examples, and why am I having a hard time mm. even? Why is there such a barrier there? Like yeah. this, we're not talking about an opinion. We're talking mm -hmm. about data. Wow, that is <laughs> massive. Pick any one of those massive. questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you, so what you're getting at, I think, is that the challenge of trying to convince people about white privilege and that it, it exists. Yeah. I think where does that come from? In part, because like everything you laid out, it's it's fact, and yet I think there are many. I'm not white, obviously, but. But I've seen that too, that tendency to discount all that data. Or, or like MLK came along, mm -hmm. we've named a street after him, so we're good now. We're good now, right? Yeah. You have you know, a black president for eight we're years. We're a black president, so we must be a uh, post-racial society, right? You hear a lot of that language, and I, I think part of that comes from a very strong cultural bent in America towards individualism, yeah. where we are in charge of our own destiny. And if we just work hard enough, we will succeed. Like that American dream is there for anybody. And there are so many exceptional cases like Obama, like other folks who have kind of done really well, that it's, seen, it's painting this narrative that success in the American way is accessible to anyone. And, and, and what's crazy is that's the, that uh, you've hit on something because that's what um, 
that's what you'll hear from from white people, people of privilege. Mm. When they look at someone, like it, they'll look at an inner city neighborhood mm. and they say, well, if they just worked hard enough. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're a church person, if you're a pastor and you're mm -hmm. saying that, you need to realize you're getting a government handout right mm. now in the form of your tax mm. rebates and stuff for being a, yeah. a nonprofit, for being a church institution, yeah. your pastoral allowance. Guess what? That's a, that's a subsidy. <laughs> And uh, your your subset, and not only that, but your entire like wealth accrual has happened because of s government subsidies. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. so, and then you're railing on a different kind of people because you, they need to work harder. Well, mm -hmm. you, you don't come from a background where you just work harder. You right. come from a background where you were given a lot of stuff that was built on the backs of free labor. Right, right, right. And people, I think, don't realize that differentials, just even starting out. There's a, an amazing talk that people should just go find by Tom Skinner, black leader who gave it at Urbana in 1970, I think it was. So talk about prophetic. I mean, this is, you know, but you listen to this talk and it sounds just as relevant today as yeah. back then. And one of the things he talks about is people keep telling me to pull myself up by my bootstraps. Like they are telling me just do that. But people don't realize that my bootstraps are getting cut <laughs> Every time I try to do that, they're already cut. So how can I even pull myself up when there are no bootstraps to begin with? This whole idea that he's already starting out yeah. at a disadvantage. And I think people have a hard time, particularly in America, with that kind of corporate acknowledgement that that, that is reality, yeah. systemically, structurally. It's more, I am doing my own thing, and I don't really have to worry about other people, whether they are disadvantaged, because they can just you know pull themselves yeah. up by yeah, their bootstraps. Yeah, yeah. So there really is still an education process that happens ha has to happen in the church. And I love that you already have this amazing body of knowledge and you are articulating that and more church leaders have to do that. More pastoral leaders have to do that kind of hard work of getting down deep and dirty with those uncomfortable facts of the realities yeah. of those injustices. I think for some people, it's either ignorance and just not knowing, quite honestly. Even the redlining you brought up, I think it was Ta-Nehisi Coates' article in The Atlantic, The Case for Case Reparations. reparations. Yes. That, that, I mean, that all of a sudden, it, that was fact, it was it, it was out there, but yet it took that. Maps, literally maps, literally with maps. red lines drawn around Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And they could not get a federally backed loan. And if you were white, you could. It was amazing, this right? Is, again, it's, this is not it's, opinion. It, it's not opinion, it's data. And yet for that article, I think, opened so many people's eyes to a reality they had never heard of. So again, education, awareness, that's yeah. a huge part of it still in the, in, in the church, right? Because yeah. in the church, you know, on, they've been on both sides of it, right? In some cases, we have great stories of people in the civil rights era and other times who have stood up against those injustices. Yeah. But we have many, many more stories where the church was complicit. And being able to own that reality, lament that reality, confess it, and be able to bring the congrega congregations they minister to, to owning that reality as yeah, well. Yeah, We're yeah. still in that process. So the justice piece is an ongoing process, yeah. but we can't get there without the awareness and the understanding and the acceptance of our own corporate role yeah. in these dynamics, in these, in these issues. Well, like you said about him being told to pull himself up by his bootstraps, mm -hmm. it's like the people that are telling him mm -hmm. to pull himself up by his bootstraps had their bootstraps pulled up by the government. That's right. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, or, and, or, I mean, either discriminatory housing laws or, or the fact that, um, you know, your entire economy is built mm. on the back of free labor, on yep. slavery. I mean, that's what slavery was. It it's was. free labor. Absolutely. And uh, someone said this yesterday, and it's, it's very funny and very sad and very true at the same time. It's like, what businessman, think, it's talking about the American economy built on the backs of slavery, what businessman, if given a free warehouse, mm -hmm. free distribution, free labor, right. you know, free product management, yeah. free you know, everything, yeah. what businessman wouldn't turn that into a successful an, a enterprise? Successful enterprise? So it's like, right. and then we celebrate that and go, oh, America is this great successful right. enterprise, and yet, we don't realize that this great successful economic engine is built on free labor. Right. Uh, there was no way to get it. There was no way to there mess it up. No. It's like you, you started out with the bootstraps pulled way up Absolutely. for you. And Absolutely. then you turn around and tell someone else, Hey, if you just work hard enough, like 
There's only, my question is to someone that says that is, why do you say that? Mm -hmm. There's only two answers to that question. Either you, either you legitimately believe that there is something in that person's DNA mm. that's wrong, or you don't understand the the history and the injury that's happened right. that has put someone there, and yeah. you don't understand, and you don't understand the degree to which you had hands yeah. lifting your bootstraps right. for you right. in the form of not just sentiment and opinion, but in the form mm -hmm. of government policy. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that what you articulated there is that for some people, they will say, I'm not racist. I love people of all colors. And so they feel like they're, they're all set then. Yeah. Um, but I think what you articulated on the, on the second thing, the second point is just as important, is understanding that history, that background. I mean, think of the two major economic engines for the U.S in those days of cotton and yeah. tobacco. I mean, that backbreaking work for, to get America where it was economically was done, as you mentioned, yeah, yeah. on the back of slaves. And there was no other way yeah. that those yeah. crops could be picked, hand-picked, every single one of those little cotton mills. Um, there's no way that happens without free labor. And that, again, yeah, built on the back of slaves. And there's right. no doubt about that.